it in. All right, welcome everybody to another edition of Legal Tech Week, the show where we talk about the top stories in legal tech and innovation from the past week. It is March 31st, 2023, and uh, gee, we should have done an April Fool's edition, but we can mm. see we can do that another time. We can all make up our... Well, it's it's uh, still early in the stuff. show, Bob. It's, it it's may still, turn into one. Yeah. It's still early. <laughs> Touche. <It's> still, yeah. <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I, I started kind of... I used to always do an April Fool's post, and then I, I got burned. I, or I, I don't know if I got burned, but I burned some people who believed what I wrote and uh, got some really bad, angry feedback from people saying, how dare you mislead me in that way? I trust you for your credibility. And I'm like, oh, geez, it's April 1st. What do you think? But... <laughs> So I've, I have tried to avoid April Fool's post for a while. Anyway, I am Bob Ambrogi. I write the blog Law Sites and have the podcast Law Next. Uh, and our guests today, as you see them, uh, starting with our guest panelist today, Greg Lambert, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Greg Lambert. I'm the Chief Knowledge Services Officer at Jackson Walker in Houston, Texas. And I blog at Three Geeks in a Law blog and podcast at The Geek and Review. Superhuman nerd, hasn't it? Yes. And, uh, Super geek. And, yeah. And uh, making a return appearance after a few weeks away from the show is Caroline Hill. Caroline. <laughs> yeah. Always like to make a big return on it. <laughs> I feel like some of the stuff that we're dramatic writing right entrance. Now, it feels like some, uh, every day is a bit like April Fool's Day at the moment. I'm not going to lie. But anyway, but yeah, Caroline Hill, um, Editor-in-Chief of Legal IT Insider, based in the UK, but we have a global audience. And it's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Jean O'Grady, who also has a global audience, I think. Right. I, I'm uh, the uh, editor and author of Dewey B. Strategic, which covers legal research, knowledge, and anything else I feel like. And I also write a monthly column for Legal Tech Hub. Whatever that is. And Steve Embry. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Embry, who probably does not have a global reach, but <laughs> I write the blog Tech Law Crossroads about legal innovation, legal technology, and like Gene, whatever the hell else I feel like. <laughs> and, and Steve's big in Belgium, from what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to point out we have a diversity of accents today. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, all right. Well, this is sort of the uh, uh, post legal week co down with COVID edition. As as unfortunately, a couple of our couple of our panelists are down with COVID this week. Unfortunately, as just as I'm finally recovering, so they can't blame me because I wasn't at legal week. But uh, there was a, a whole lot of it going around there, apparently. Um, I forget, Greg, were you at Legal Week? I was not, but I was yeah. feeling real issues of FOMO uh, by yeah. not being there this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. It, was, it oh. was only one conversation, Greg. You didn't miss it. You, you heard it all. On I wonder what it was about. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's true. It, <laughs> we could just do it in three little letters. Right. Yep. <laughs> It was great. It was brilliant. It was. I mean, and you. I'm not going to go into it because I know you had your show last week. Yeah, but I'd love to hear that. your thoughts because you, you were here last week. Energized. I thought it was fabulous. Like I was really good. Loads of meetings. Really. Good. But apart from as we were saying just before we went on air, but everyone I know got did get sick. So my colleagues Neil Cameron and Emma Griffiths both came down with either COVID or something like it. But I don't know. I think maybe so. It was a like, super spreader event, the AI version. <laughs> Yeah, we um, should. We should. But it wasn't ask Bob's fault. Chat GPT. We should <laughs> ask Chat GPT what happened and why. Why have so many people got COVID at Legal Week? <laughs> too, many, too many hugs. Too many hugs. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, there are a lot of people. Uh, so it could be true. Um, and it didn't. Didn't we were just talking? It didn't happen at ABA Tech Show. So it's kind of interesting, or that I heard of. Anyway, maybe maybe ABA Tech Show is better. Uh, better. Uh, that's because, uh, That's exactly right, Bob. That's because we we're a better show. <laughs> no, I was I was going to say, what what am I trying to say? Better uh, uh, crisis control or something in in the uh, aftermath of the show when in fact half the audience died. We don't know. But, but uh, I think I, I actually think at Legal Tech, the, at Legal Week, the, the the exhibit halls felt incredibly crowded, and they always feel incredibly crowded. Yeah. 
And I, I think that's the Petri dish is the exhibit. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I, I actually, I don't feel, I don't get claustrophobic, but I was in a rush trying to find something and I was trying to find my way out of the exhibit hall. I couldn't find the exit and I flew into a complete panic, which is very unusual for me. And I was running around. If anyone saw me, I think I completely lost my mind. Just going, where's the exit? Where's the exit? Because everything was on top of everything. It was, it was rammed, wasn't it? Well, yeah, they I do what they is. did last year, which is where they changed the exit to a different floor. You couldn't get out on the floor you used to be able to get out on. And so you, everybody was confused. It was like people were like stuck. Yeah, yeah. I, I did that at Legal Value Network at their conference in September. And it was so crowded that and I'm I'm a huge extrovert. And I was like backing out of the room. I was like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> I was I was just getting ready to ask you, Greg, how crowded was it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it was crowded enough for me to leave. That's that's how crowded it was. So. Yeah. Well, Legal Week pulls the thing where they cram, they, they do cram the exhibitors in more tightly and they make the aisles narrower so that it'll look like a more robust exhibit hall. Uh, you know, I don't know if you guys, I mean, some of you may remember years ago when it was like three solid filled floors of exhibitors and that just doesn't happen anymore there. So they need to make it look bigger than it is, I think, or more. There were quite a lot of exhibitors this year, I think. Um, there, there were three, there were three floors, weren't there? So, so there was a floor that I didn't even know existed because I didn't look at my book and, and then went down and went, oh my God, there's a whole other place. <laughs> <laughs> which is not great I didn't yeah. Really yeah and then there was like the you know yeah anyway there were three all right all right well uh let's get to let's get to the stories for the week and uh Greg you get guest privileges I'm going to let you yeah. pick whatever you want to talk about first uh so why don't you kick it off well I want to talk about uh chat GPT no I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> let's chat about chat GPT, chat GPT. actually uh that. <laughs> yeah, this this week I had uh, a returning guest, uh, Nicole Braddock, uh, came in from uh, Theory and Principle, and she's always just a fantastic guest to have on. She's you know high energy, does lots of lots of really good stuff, and and I thought you know she kind of brought us back to reality that you know with with all of the hype around everything else that's going on with. Uh, with the product that that will be named multiple times in this in this uh, presentation, I'm sure. But uh, you know, she she really brought it back to design, to back to that user interface and user experience. And I think that's you know, and and I've said this a number of times is I think that's what ChatGPT got right was its user interface uh, much more than the product because again. It's not like we haven't been talking about AI for the past five years. Um, it's you know it's just something that's that's been going on. It's just been going on in the background, and I think, and and maybe I'm talking a little out of school here, but I think it's one of the things like with the Harvey AI is we're here. You know we're getting a lot of PR. Which Harvey AI? Yeah, the the, the, the Harvey dot AI. Um, but you know we're ge we're getting a lot of secondhand, thirdhand information on that. But no one, uh, no one I know of has actually interacted with it. And so, okay, one person I know has interacted with it. Um, and so, you know, and I think one of the success stories is that you've got to have a way that engages the user in in the information that makes them feel. Like they're part of the process and i think it's been the thing that has really been missing in all the ai tools is that you know the magic happens off screen and you you put in something it does something and then you get back something but you don't get that you know you, you don't get that wow factor uh from it and i think that uh, you know when when you talk with someone like uh uh, Nicole Braddock, who that's her job is to work with, you know, tech companies, law firms to get that wow factor of getting that engagement with the user. And I think that's that's one of the things that that were, you know, if you're not careful, you can create really cool, useful stuff that no one's going to use um, just because they don't feel like they have a hand in the process. Uh, of it. And, 
<clears throat> and kind of on a on a side note, hopefully this pulls together, is the one thing that's just really, really frustrating me is I'm getting a, a, a slap in the face reminder of just how uncreative, how un, um, you know, there's just not this curiosity with a lot of the attorneys in this, in big law to use these tools. And it's really kind of frustrating that, you know, you've got something that I think is, is particularly game changing. And there's just this huge lack of curiosity that I'm seeing from a lot of people. Well, I agree. You know, that's, go ahead, Jane. I was we like, all want to throw that. Let me throw that grenade out there. Support, they, they'll start paying attention. You know, the, the Goldman Sachs report that was released, and it was reported on law.com, says that 43% of all legal related jobs are going to be impacted by uh, GPT. So at some point, they're going to have to start caring. Yeah. Is that what you're saying, Greg? So that's fascinating. It, I, oh, sorry. So, because uh, I, I, sorry, Stu. Uh, I um, I've had emails from lawyers. It's quite funny, actually. I had a, and it, uh, so you're obviously seeing this firsthand, perhaps that lack of engagement, or I don't know, anyway. But so I, I'm getting emails from lawyers saying, "How do I get the, get my hands on various things?" I, that Harvey was one actually. Yeah. One an email got an email from a lawyer saying, "How do I? Can you introduce me to Harvey? You know, how do I work with it?" And I introduced him to. Um, some contacts of mine who are actually doing a chat BT add in for Outlook and um, were looking for law firms for the beta and actually turned out they were working with that firm anyhow but I thought that was fascinating that's one of the first times I've had a lawyer come to me and go can you can you can I get my hands on yeah. that tech? well and and you're right I think that there are some but I think even if you look at the Lexus survey and Bob you you ran the story last uh, last week or week before on the the Lexus survey to where I, I forget, you know, it's like 2% of the lawyers are using it daily. And, you know, it's like some people have used it some, you know, a little bit. And mm -hmm. there's a huge percentage that has never even taken a look at it. And, yeah, but I think, I, but you're right, Caroline, they're, they're, the people that are using it see the wow factor. Yeah. Um, but I think I there think, are some people that just have absolutely no curiosity um, well, it, it's, I think it's a couple of things, and, and you, you touched on both of them, and certainly Nicole did. You know, number one, it, a lot of the legal tech for so long was difficult to use, time-consuming to learn, quick here, quick there, quick here, quick there, and particularly for a, a industry, many members of which bill by the hour, that was a that was a killer, right? I mean, because uh, you know, if I have to take three hours out of the day to learn how to use a piece of technology, I mean, that's three hours of time, billable time, right? And and most lawyers, partners, and associates have quotas that they have to make for the year, and so it's a sacrifice. You know, that's on the one hand, and then you know, on the other hand, and I and I wrote a piece about this too. I mean, it's the whole most of the legal industry is built upon leverage, knowable hours and leverage. And that all depends on not having tools that can make you more efficient, like a lot of the AI tools can. So it's, you kind of got these two factors, I think, you know, lawyers being reluctant, because they think it's going to take a lot of time, because everything else always has, uh, not, and I'm being over, gen, over generalizing there, it's not everything has, but you know, the, the tools that we I've seen get the most traction in the legal community are the ones that are the easiest to use. Um, so, yeah. but you got that factor. Yeah. The, the lawyers are, are suspicious that it's going to take a lot of time. And B, I mean, we're still, I think, saying, well, okay, if I have a tool that can write a brief in half the time, I mean, that's like, that's, that's oh. like dollars out of my pocket. Why do I want to do that again? And, and, or, and you know, I, so, I understand the old, the old saying yeah. is, you know, how do you tell a room full of millionaires that they're, that they're doing it wrong? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I agree to that. The, the issue that I'm having is that I, I tend to tell people, think of it in the same way that you look at a tool like practical law. If you're addressing an, a novel issue to you and it happens 
to all of us. We always get something that's a little outside of our comfort zone. Um, some of the best use cases that I've seen for people using something like this is when they get, you know, they're a corporate lawyer that gets tossed into a real estate deal. Um, this helps get them the vocabulary to use. And it's something that we've, we've talked about uh, for years. And that is a, you know, a lot of partners, even senior associates will tell juniors that, look, I don't mind you coming to me and asking me any question that, you know, you need help with, but I expect you to at least go to Google first and, you know, figure out some of the basics of it. This thing really kind of helps get people up to speed at, and, and again, it may cite to the wrong thing, but most mm -hmm. of the time when it comes to the topic, it's actually pretty good at, at defining the topic. It may be wrong in the sites, but you, then you take the real tools and you go and you find the sites. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, sites. I think if you get to uh, the point, if you take kind of Nicole Braddock's idea about, you know, enhancing the, the UI for this technology, uh, and and apply that to to generative AI. We're probably going to pretty quickly get to the point where lawyers are using this stuff and they don't even know they are using it. So when you do the next Lexa survey, when they say, "Are you using generative AI?" It's going to be like the, in the old days of the cloud when lawyers would say, "No, I'm not using the cloud." When they're Hell using no. cloud apps all the time. <laughs> I mean, anyone who's been using Microsoft has already been using generative AI for a while, yeah. right? and if we see, you know, if you're yeah. transcribing stuff or even in spell check or whatever it is, they've been they've been doing this for a while. But the, what, one head of legal tech at a big company I was speaking to recently on on the subject of using it, he was saying one of the things he doesn't think is being talked about enough is how exciting it is from, the, the, he, he had has obviously had a quite a po positive experience in terms of the interactions that he's come across. And he said that it's been quite exciting in terms of people really, the way people have taken to it, but the, taken to a tech product. And he was saying, imagine, the potential for an in, in, in internal for enterprise search, for example, for for sort of you know drawing things for if you are a global firm, sort of being able to for, to have. I mean, the example that he gave was he could say someone abroad, what what are they having for lunch in London? I don't know. He was giving up stupid examples, but he's saying, imagine how much if you can really start to leverage this sort of type type of technology internally and really start to be able to just engage naturally, and how much potential it has in terms of bringing the firm closer and he was just sort of going down this rabbit hole of what you could do with it which I thought was quite, and he was saying it was quite exciting Andrew Reed is having a field day talking about <laughs> <laughs> imagine if you used AI for legal research <laughs> it's, it's an idea it's a it's novel an it's a novel idea Andrew you should get on that <laughs> <laughs> he's 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 moved on to uh, he's moved on to uh, better industries. Uh, oh my God. So um, well, I, well, I mean, really, none of this is going to matter thought, because uh, because uh, according to uh, an article that Caroline that you you picked up on, we're we're just going to be suspending development of all this stuff for the next six months, right? There's not going to be any uh, any development of of generative AI. Yeah, I mean, is it is that really? I'm not really sure. I, I, I can't. So yeah, these these leaders are sort of about twelve hundred um, tech leaders and AI researchers. The found the co-founder of Apple, um, Elon Musk, was in there. And they've obviously, I and mean, this has been widely reported, obviously, throughout all of the mainstream news, talking about how beyond GPT four they should sort of pause development. Um, and I think there's been, you know, a lot of skepticism about what is that exact? How how would they do that? What does that mean? Is it practical? Is it realistic? Why are they publishing this letter in the first place? Is it because? <laughs> is it because actually this is this is like an arms race, right? Like this yeah. is there's such a huge competitive edge. Microsoft is kill well, OpenAI sorry is killing it. Um, and is there is this genuine? Do they, uh, what's their motive? And I think that everybody's now going to have to start questioning everything that we read. And actually, I didn't put enough commentary around this because it was a crazy busy week, but I feel like going back and just adding my thoughts on the, the letter, just saying, you know, let's, let's be careful. Let's be cynical now in terms of these are the big, the big tech companies are that. So the, so the tech companies were highlighted. And so the, the, the signatories to the letter said that AI labs were in a tech and arms in a, in a race and they needed to stop. And then it was all getting completely out of hand. Um, and, um, but actually, you know, you think, well, 
they are all going to want a stake, right? They're all going to want to you leverage generative AI in their own capacity to, if they're not already or do. Uh, so I just I just didn't think that it was probably very genuine personally, but I don't know. I don't know what any, anyone else thought about it. To me, it seemed ludicrous. I mean, the, the idea that it's just not going to happen. I mean, these companies that are sitting on a gold mine of a product here right now and and uh you know they're they're not going to just say yeah let's just stop developing this for six months and and of course trust that their competitors are also going to stop developing it for six months it's not going to happen i mean the only thing i would i would agree so so i was speaking to somebody today um who was talked about using this kind of technology with no knowledge of what you're doing, like like putting a nuclear button and then just pressing it to see what happens. Right? I'm, I'm not saying that we don't need to be more thoughtful. I'm not saying, and I feel like vendors need to be much more, you know, they need to educate people about what this means, I think. Um, and But but I, but yeah, I don't think it was, gen the motive was genuine and obviously people listening in agree. <laughs> yeah. Given, yeah. given the, given the lead author of it, I've, Intend to think you're right, but but didn't I didn't I see? I thought I saw something. I was trying to find it a news flash that Italy had had banned the use yeah, of yeah they have chat GPT for, yeah but because of I guess privacy concerns but yeah imagine that <laughs> yeah that that should work that yeah. <laughs> end of that story <laughs> yeah <That's squelch> it. <laughs> yeah no um yeah I mean. I don't know. Yeah, it's been just a week of everybody panicking and and everything I wrote was about AI. I'll comment on to that if you're interested. But I, I wrote um, in the orange rag, which I published today. My my opening comment was, you know, um, that that you know, can we talk about something else? <laughs> um, but um, yeah. I think the good so the UK government, you know, published its own regulation. Um, I just think that this, you know, we we. I think that we are in a very different place, right? With with the new large language models, we are in a very different place to the place we were before when there was all the hysteria over AI. It can do so much more. It, you know, I've had conversations with people saying, "Is this the real deal?" Am I, am I, um, and then that the absolutely categorically different in terms of the what it's capable of doing, and, and particularly in the law where it's all about language. So there's no there's no doubt that that it's you know, fundamentally different. And it's going to, there's going to be huge, it has a huge impact. It's already having a huge impact, but it's, it's about being thoughtful and strategic and not just bunging it in everywhere. And, you know, like being clear about your motives. And if you're, if you're interested, being strategic about it. Um, and I'm, I'm amazed, actually, Greg, you touched on this at the beginning, but you said about this is AI has been here coming for a long time. And actually what I'm quite surprised about, and I wrote about today, a number of people that seem to have been taken by surprise by this and that's slightly concerning you know i wrote a piece today saying if you um you shouldn't really be your strategy shouldn't be dictated by microsoft press releases and i have to say i can't take all the credit for that because that comes from a really great conversation with um with a, a legal tech head at a big global law firm who's as yet not on the record but um but yeah it's just surprising the turmoil that it's caused it's quite surprising yeah Something I wrote about this week um, is the, it, 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 I don't think, it's not necessarily a huge story in and of itself, which was this Black Boiler, which is a, a contract uh, review uh, platform, you know, red lines, documents, right, in Microsoft's track changes. Uh, but they introduced this feature called Context AI, uh, which is interesting simply because as it's making red lines in a contract, it's it's giving you the explanation for why it's making those red lines and those edits. Uh, and, and I think that is really going to be, I think that's representative of what's going to be a significant trend in legal, which is this whole idea of explainability of the AI. And you see that with with the case text co-counsel too. I mean, when you you know, do something in co-counsel, it not only gives you the kind of the answer, but it gives you the citations or the places in the record or whatever, where it found that to give you that answer. So again, it's giving you that explainability. Um, and I think, uh, you know, given this whole, uh, you know, all the talk about AI hallucinations and, and the fear about uh, AI in a legal field, you know, making up cases and making up legal authorities, 
uh, the ability to partner AI technology with some degree of explainability uh, is going to be really important. And then, and then Dan takes it even further, and Dan Broderick at, at the Black Boiler takes it even further and says, uh, you know, control also is a, is part of what law firms are going to want here. The, the the, the ability to have some control over how the AI is doing what it's doing, how the al you know how the algorithm is working, if if that's even possible, uh, I I know other other people kind of mock that idea. I think I think the last time I talked to Pablo Arredondo about it, he's like, oh yeah, really, lawyers want to go in and control how their legal research algorithm is working. I mean, uh, law librarians do maybe, but whether lawyers actually want to do, I don't know. But I I think those two factors of control and explainability will be uh hallmarks of ai and legal going forward and it'll create new jobs and new jobs they'll, like they'll be the chat like, gpp explainers yeah. like well i mean didn't you add one this week right yeah, yeah. I, I saw a story actually i picked it up because uh, it was about catherine lowry the cio and it's uh, at uh baker and Hotstetler. she was commenting on the fact that mish Condorea has created a chat gp position and the person, I think it's called a GPT legal prompt engineer who's supposed to explore ways to use it. Uh, but she said, and because she's she is obviously in a firm where they have been looking at these technologies for a long time. She said, we don't really need a special position. We think we already have the right talent here. But for firms that are just starting, yeah, they may have to create those positions. But I actually do think there's going to be new kinds of opportunities for people to manage the, this kind of, you know, whether it's just testing and validating the output, but I think it's it's not going to be that we plug it in and walk away and nobody and everybody just says, I trust it. There's going to have to be lots of validation processes and people to oversee those processes. You would hope. <laughs> <laughs> All the lawyers who are out of a job, thanks to GPT, can get jobs as prompt just forty-four engineers. percent. Yeah. <laughs> just forty. <laughs> yes, I'm a prompt engineer. Um, I'm a legal prompt engineer. Illegal, Has to have illegal legal prompt engineer. legal on the on the front end. But the, it's so it's okay though because you know all those lawyers that that are going to have some of their work replaced, they can now all spend their time thinking strategically and visualizing, visioning for their client. <laughs> So, so there's, uh, I mean, every lawyer is very capable of doing that, right? That could be a job, Steve. <laughs> Chief visualizer. I think that might That's be right. Let me write Actually, that down. <laughs> I, I, I thought years ago that law firms needed a chief query officer. The new yeah. role is to understand, are you asking the right questions? And that applies to, to AI, especially. Yep. It's all about asking the right question. Well, you're when when our jobs right have all gone, when our jobs have all gone, because it, they're being done by ChatGPT, and you know, hopefully, I'll be on a beach in the Bahamas while ChatGPT is writing. <laughs> I, mean, I got a podcast that does that. Yeah. You, you'll be done the wiser, but otherwise, I'll be chief visualizer somewhere. Like <laughs> I thought, I saw a story that an entire issue of BuzzFeed was written by GPT. So I guess all our blogs will be gone. <laughs> Yeah, oh that'll happen. Um, uh, actually, that was an interesting story. <laughs> Who picked up on, was it, Greg, maybe you pointed out the one for, that Kevin O'Keefe wrote this week oh, yeah. about, about uh, the idea. Well, you can tell. Yeah, it, well, and the, the idea is, you know, this, just think of the basic things that this changes, such as search engine optimization. So this the CEO of of Google, what's his name, Sun, uh, Sunday, or Sundar uh, Pichai, Pichai, um, was asked on uh, what was it, uh, uh, Hard Fork, the podcast, uh, Hard Fork. He was interviewed by the New York Times and the the other guy uh, about that. In that, the business model of Google for search is going to get upended. And so they basically said, look, you've kind of got a conflict of interest here because if you get barred, which is very milk toast at the moment, but if you get this thing up to speed, it's going to change how people do search engine 
uh, you know, how they search uh, because they're not necessarily going to click through to get the answer. They're going to have the answer right there. And, you know, he kind of hemmed and hawed around it and, and used some uh, statistics, uh, you know, to bend in, in the right way to tell the story. Um, but uh, I think they realize it, that this is, you know, this sort of thing where people don't just put in one or two words and then look for results, but they put in a full question or a, a large query and they get an answer, aren't going to go out any further than that. And, and, and for that's, all of us who publish blogs, that means their, fewer, fewer clicks on our blogs. Exactly. Well, and, you know, and I think, again, the creative folks are going to love this because that means that you're going to have to basically train the model in order for it to come back with the result. It's a different type of search engine optimization in a way. It's a, you know, it's a, uh, a, 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 an AI, a generative AI optimization. And that's going to, you know, we talk about query or uh, to talk about prompt engineers you know, there's going to be a whole nother market on the on the other side that shows this is this is how you set things up to be trained in the right way. So it's going to going to be really interesting. It, it kind of raises an interesting philosophical question, I think, because uh, so so right now, let's assume I want a new pair of running shoes. So I go to Google and I search, you know, running shoes, and I've got various places to go, and so I can look at those and. And I can make up my mind which ones that I really think are best. But so in the future, though, I could go to chat GPT and say, pick me up. Well, what's the best running shoe for me? And it would say New Balance. Right. So I don't have to look anymore. I just take what it gives me. So just it's says kind of like you're a, over 50. Yeah. yeah. New Balance. Yeah. Or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of it, so you, you, you sort of lose some of your choice i mean it, it but, i don't know it's a little it's kind of interesting are you saying that chat G, T, gbt won't be looking at your demographics and responding to the to some level of advertising to push certain things to you based on your demographics <laughs> are you saying that's going to go away i'm not sure yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah but uh, the, the difference is now i've got several i've got four or five maybe i've got 10 options to click through in with with this tool uh, you know, I could dig deeper and get more options. On the other hand, it could just say, here's the best one for you. And I'd say, yeah, I'll take that because I don't want to mess around and well, look that, at the other options. So what does that, that do to uh, all the competitors with running shoes, you know? <laughs> with um, with legal, with litigation anal analytics, that's occurred to me, for, you know, for a while in terms of if you, you know, the way that they're presenting the judges and the results, and it becomes like an almost like a self fulfilling thing if you if you if you sort of deep deep dig down into what a lot of the analytics are doing in terms of not just predict, it's not just showing you what perhaps behavior was, but actually then they'll start to go to that judge and get that same result. And so it actually starts to change behavior, doesn't it? You know, I've, I've sort of thought that it's already happening to an extent, even, you know, within the legal sector. Well, but Bob, you left my Predicta article off the list today, which is exactly what, what Dan Rabinowitz is doing. He's studying- I thought we talked about it last week. I don't know why- I, I, I did, but I mean, the, yeah, okay. Caroline is really, that's what she's referring yeah. to, but he's doing it in a completely <laughs> new way where he is identifying all of these Mm. non-obvious demographics and putting them into the algorithm like where did they go to school what what kind of stocks yeah. do they own and that's how he's coming to and he says you know i kept my article starts out by saying this is absolutely horrifying and yet the algorithm is right 85 percent of the time you know i can not believe it yeah. gene either when i'd had a demo at legal week and i was saying and i kept challenging him saying right so if I live here and I went to Harvard and I, how do you know I'm going to make that decision? <laughs> you know, it's just like, he was, you know, he was explaining it to me and I was like, well, you can't, you know, it was, yeah, it's, it's kind of, that's, fa it's fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and really he's the only one who, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, you know, Lex Machina's of the world are, are not claiming to be predictive. Uh, and he's the only one who really is claiming to be predictive in his analytics but then, but then, it, then it, you know, we, I don't I think we might have talked about this after. So I saw this at ILTA in London. I saw this brilliant speaker called Dr. Hannah, Professor Hannah Fry, Dr. Hannah Fry, who was talking about 
you know, litigation analytics often being wrong, right? So they, she gave an example of sentencing and she gave an example of this 18-year-old um, who was charged with statutory rape because he was in a relationship with a 14-year-old. And obviously they were in love. They were actually in a relationship, but, you know, she was too young, but it was not what... And the algorithm went said, oh... Well, he's got a really long time to offend because he's only 18. And if, 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 if they threw in a lot of the numbers, if he was 36, then he should get a much lower sentence because he had much less time to offend. <laughs> so she was saying, well, obviously, if it was a 36-year-old and a 14-year-old, human beings would say to you, that is really bad, right, rather than a native. But so the computer got, the, and actually he got a much higher, he actually did get a much higher sentence. I can't remember his name, but she was giving us the case. Um, Anyway, I was, I was challenging um, Dan from Predictor about this and we're having a really interesting chat. I was like, well, what if it gets it wrong? And how does it make this decision? And I think we need to, it's fascinating, but I think we also need to keep continuously questioning, right? Like just going, not going, oh my God, it's got it right. Well, there's the, there's the issue that every lawyer thinks they're a special snowflake and that they're going to be able to convince the judge to do something. It doesn't matter what the judge has done 20 times in the past. When the judge hears their arguments, that lawyer's arguments, they're going to be convinced that, uh, uh, you know, they should change all their precedent or do it different or whatever. I mean, that's that's where a lot of lawyers stumble on analytics is this idea that, you know, I don't care what the judge did in 10 out of 20, 10 out of 15 cases before my case is going to be different because my brief is going to be so brilliant or my argument is going to be so brilliant or my cross examination is going to be so brilliant or whatever. Right, Steve, or you were my, there. <laughs> or, 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 my, or my facts are just a little different. Yeah, 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 right. You know, which is, I mean, that's what we've all, we've done historically as, as sure. lawyers, as we've distinguished cases, because well, in my case, you know, he he was, I was run into when the other driver was reading his text on his cell phone. That's not like this case. And so it's, you know. Yeah, yeah. Someone um, had an interesting point, um, I thought, about whether law firms, because there's a load of chat, it's quite fun, but <laughs> I can't, multi can't multitask, can't find it either. But anyway, it's about whether law firms need to hire dedicated people um, specialising in LLM. And I do think there's probably some merit, to, because I do worry that there's a lot of, obviously someone also mentioned co-pilot, which is, I'm sure you talked about last week, perhaps, or but I've written about in the last week, talking about Microsoft bringing in GPT across the whole of the 365 suite. And but I do think that law firms are going to need to have, if they don't, I probably do already have people that have the expertise. Do you need to bring someone down? Yeah, they're, they're called librarians. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a language issue, right? It's meta, yeah. it's meta language, it's meta, it's the language, it's, it's, you know, uh, subject matter experts. Yeah. Um, they've got the people um, it's just a matter of reallocating resources. And again, it goes back to this being curious and creative with what you have to see what it is that how you how you can leverage this, you know, in, in the best way to, that makes sense for your firm or university or company. Um, so there's great opportunity and it's limited by people's, you know, experience, curiosity, and and expertise. And not knowledge. I think this is good. We're going to see. It. We've already been going this way, but I think there's going to be a big rebirth of knowledge management. Yeah. In the new era for K. Well, ho hopefully this time it's not just about knowledge management as a technology. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. That's happening. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, well, back in the good old days, before we used to talk about things before GPT, uh, one of the things we used to talk about is access to justice and uh, ways of enhancing access to justice. And Steve, you've got a story this week that takes us back yeah. to those good old days. <laughs> <laughs> back to when we used to talk about people and what their roles could yeah. be and yeah. what they could do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I picked it up out of, um, I guess, the Colorado Supreme Court has now... Um, approved licensing and allowing uh, uh, legal paraprofessionals, paralegals, I guess, I don't want to use the, the non-word, but um, people who are not lawyers to do certain things in domestic relation cases. Um, and that would include uh, divorces, um, 
parental rights adjudications, those sorts of things. Um, they can, you know, these, these people once licensed could file pleadings, um, represent clients in mediations. Uh, I mean, they're very particular, uh, or, or the, the court was very particular. They, they can go to hearings and answer factual questions, but they can't argue the case. <laughs> So it's kind of kind of an interesting little deal. Um, and uh, they can't examine witnesses. And they have a whole list of like 13, 14 things that these people can't do, uh, which I thought was was really kind of funny. But uh, and then the other thing I thought was pretty interesting is that to, to get one of these licenses, you have to uh, demonstrate that you've had 1500 hours of of practical substantial legal experience in these matters and it was the immediate irony that hit me is so like like i can you can license me to sort of answer pleadings that provided i have 1500 hours of practical experience but i become i can become a lawyer if i can pass the exam that now chat gpt can pass and i have to have i don't have to have any practical experience and then i can do all these other things which i thought was kind of ironic but it it did strike me that you know the the, the trend seems to be, well, courts and states seem to be much more open to this kind of approach um, to, to get at the access to justice dilemma, much more so than changing rules about law firm ownership and, and those sorts of things. And, um, you know, it's a step in the right direction, although now that we've had our, our, our weekly chat GPT discussion, most of the things that these paraprofessionals be licensed to do, I guess chat GPT can soon do. So maybe we'll have to figure out a way to license chat GPT to do them. But well, now <laughs> and I, was, I, I thought it was, I mean, it is, I, I, I don't mean to be critical of the whole thing. I thought it was a, a good step. And, you know, there's so many people that, that are facing these kinds of issues um, that are just petrified of the cost of lawyers and, and how to deal with the system. And, you know, so they, they, they don't do anything. They suffer through abusive relationships or or what have you, because they're they're paralyzed by fear of cost and fear of not knowing what to do. And you know, many of these proceedings are pretty perfunctory uh, in a lot of ways. So it's it's a good thing, uh, I think, that that courts are opening up these kinds of actions for for people who don't have JDs and and that sort of thing and pass the bar exam to do. Yeah, I, I think it's a good thing. Uh, and I mean, it, it reflects, you know, what, what a few other states have done, what what uh, Washington State famously did and then undid with this limited license uh, technicians. Uh, I, I do think it, it, it seems uh, uh, artificially an artificial manufacturer to kind of draw this line between them going into court and sitting there and maybe answering some questions, but not being able to do anything more actively. I mean, I think that's clearly mm -hmm. a nod to the organized bar uh, in a yeah. way to uh, make this uh, more palatable to to the organized bar. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see as, as these kinds of representations um, take root and, and uh, get get more use, whether whether that role adheres over time. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I Bob, I I see this like what they do in Travis County in in Austin, Texas, with uh, they they have their um, I, I forget legal. It's it's like a legal assistance program that's uh, connected with the court. Lisa Rush uh, runs it. She has a a couple of research attorneys that don't do any. They don't actually. The, the, the job that they do is to make sure that whoever shows up before the judge is prepared. And I think if we can do this with access to justice uh, issues, I think you can take these, you know, legal professionals who may not be licensed attorneys, and you can give them tools and the ability to just have people prepared when they show up before the judge. That that one little low hanging fruit uh, would speed up the process and it would take a lot of pressure off of the bar members of the bar because they're not sitting there waiting on other people to get through because they didn't show up prepared, which causes them to be delayed 
which causes more time for them to to have to spend. So it's it's a win win, and I, I think you know, bar associations need to look at that sort of process um, first um, and see it as a you know as as a way to actually benefit the bar rather than figuring out a way to you know kind of hamstring it so that you know at the end of the day someone needs a lawyer um, who's probably not going to pay for a lawyer anyway. All right, I'll get off my soapbox now. I actually had, I just want to say, I actually had a job similar to that right when I got out of college, before I went to law school, I was working for the Vera Institute of Justice in New York City, and that's exactly what we were doing, making sure cases were ready before they went to court. And this is a long time ago, but I'm not sure whatever happened to that project. I used to do court work, but it was as before I qualified. So I qualified at Norton Rose, but before that I was working for what's now Gowling WLG and we weren't qualified. It was myself and another paralegal and we were in London and the firm was in Birmingham and they used to fax us the instructions for for court but we we could only go up to a certain level you know so we could do certain applications and we could we could sort of, but we couldn't do sort of you know go before a judge we could go before a master um but yeah i mean we, i don't i sure that doesn't really have an hj thing but um we, you know we've been able to do that for a while in terms of certain levels of the court in the uk uh all right um what else did i mean gene what else did you is there something else you had my, to talk my about? Other, well, you also wrote about it, the Walters Kluwer. Oh, yeah. Just, we were, for a couple of weeks ago, we were wondering, why isn't anybody talking about Silicon Valley? And uh, I did not know this, but a week after uh, the Silicon Valley collapse, Walters Kluwer started posting things for free. They have they put it on Vital Law and put it on their uh, in-house counsel. But there are a couple of interesting uh, resources, and they sort of followed the COVID thing of let's just do a public service. So they put all of these resource, resources are on both sides of their paywall or their subscription wall. But one is a, a, a bank failures litigation and investigation tracker. There's a communications checklist. And it's like basically due diligence, both, both for people who are at banks or who are doing bu business with banks that are about to fail or have clients who have businesses who have banks that are about to fail. So it it just you know does a couple of different things around risk and transition. So I thought it was an interesting little suite of practical guidance tools that they're putting out there for free. Yeah, I, when I, I got a demo of it uh, just yesterday, I think, and I wrote about it. Was that yesterday or today? I forget. It was yesterday um, but it was uh, I, they said, they said, well, what do you think? I said, well, why are you limiting it to corporate counsel? I mean, I think law firms have a lot of interest reaction. in this, in this issue. And uh, nope, you know, a lot of the resources actually that they put out there are, are relevant to law firms as well. Uh, so, I mean, I understand they're trying to go after a corporate counsel market with this, but um, you know, it, it, it nobody's really addressing this in a, in, a, in a big way for law firms. And I think that's a that's a critical thing. Well, it is embedded in vital law, which is the product that law firms buy. But I said to them, you completely rebrand misbranded this by calling it a product for in-house counsel because it's relevant to everybody. But they didn't yeah. to me. They didn't remove. Well, if both of us told them that, then maybe they're uh, maybe yeah. they'll listen. I I, I also told him that, Gene. So okay. <laughs> okay. But, uh, is anyone hey, from Walters clear on this? <laughs> you know, you know what was really funny, kind of a non-legal tech issue was uh, you know, being here in Texas when when SVB went went down, um, every attorney that was around in the 90s, 80s, and 90s during the savings and loan issue all had flashbacks. And mm -hmm. so it was like, you know, as everyone was thinking, you know, oh my God, here we go again. Um, but then they like after the second Friday, when only one bank failed instead of like 50, uh, they were like, ah, oh, this is nothing. We'll, we'll be OK. <laughs> I had I had the uh, slightly uh, definitely not legal tech related flashback to Mary Poppins. Did anyone see that? <laughs> you know, when there's a run on Everybody the bank. Everybody in the United States. Oh, right? and, I, and I'm like, there's a run on the bank. It's like Mary Poppins. It's actually oh. happening. <laughs> Um, the famous uh, one in the U.S. is "It's a Wonderful Life." It's a wonderful, yeah, life. yeah. That's the, that's the one that I thought of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I forgot there was a run Uncle on the George, bank issue with Mary Uncle Poppins. Billy lost the money. <laughs> yeah, and that's the first thing that popped uh, into so, my head. I'm so professional, <laughs> such a professional writer, and I was like, "Ah, oh, it's Mary Poppins." It's Mary. <laughs> 
you got to have a parallel. Uh, uh, following up on, <laughs> following up on your yeah. comment, Greg, I, I can just imagine all the lawyers in Texas immediately calling up every banking connection that they ever had in their entire life and offering their services as experts. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there's a mad rush. It, it was like you were here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, imagine. <laughs> Never been through anything like that. Never. (laughs) One of the companies that we we use had messaged to say that they had managed to get their money out of SVB and that they were transferring. And could we update our account accounting details? It kind of started to bring it home. So my goodness. Yeah, I was was... surprised. I only got one of those emails. I thought there would be more vendors contacting me about that, but I only got one contact. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think they all got rescued in time. That was the thing. Mm-hmm. They, this, you know, by the by the end of the weekend, uh, mm-hmm. they were all they were the, you know, aware they were going to get a bailout and uh, not worrying about it. I, I know, I think I mentioned this last week. I was kind of scrambling around that weekend trying to find some legal tech companies that were affected by it. And then I saw Caroline posting on Twitter looking for legal tech companies that were affected. I'm like, oh, which of us is going to get the story first? <laughs> I, I just wrote about the HSBC. I didn't actually do a legal tech angle on it. I just thought it was quite interesting about the rescue. Because, but did you you do you, you did a legal tech dedicated one? I ended up not writing about actually because what yeah. happened. I mean, I talked to several people over the weekend, but by Monday it was kind of all moot. Everything. I mean, they were worried about making payroll and stuff. And then, I mean, a couple of the ones that talked to me over the weekend, one in particular was kind of like clearly wished he hadn't talked to me after he talked to me. And I like, I you know why? I don't know why bring it out and. It, I don't know. It just didn't seem necessary to yeah. talk about the fact that this guy made a bad, he didn't make a bad banking decision. Uh, you know, he made a smart banking decision, but. Uh, yeah, it makes in, you kind of wonder how it would have happened, you know, how it would have played out if uh, if Lehman Brothers had been handled differently. Mm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so I was just going to mention the, I mean, the other just like weird story of the week uh, for me was this Harvey versus Harvey one that I, I, I wrote about. I don't know if anybody saw that, but I mean, we've all heard about Harvey AI. We've been hearing, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, it, it's, it's backed by the uh, startup fund of open AI. It's been deployed firm wide by Allen and Overy. It's been adopted by Price Waterhouse Coopers for all of its lawyers. It's been having a lot of success. Uh, and then all of a sudden this week, I think it was like Monday or something, I, I heard about this other Harvey AI. And I at first I'm like, did they just change their website or something? And I, I emailed the, the the founders of Harvey and they said, no, that ain't us. And uh, to this day, it's not quite clear who it is. Uh, I, I I got the name of the owner, uh, founder, and and I've tried to reach him several times, and he hasn't responded to me. But by the by the next day, basically after I email, I emailed him like I think it was like Monday night or something. I forget what night it was now. But it, it, by the next morning, he had taken his site down. But in the meantime, so, the guy who tipped me off to this was somebody who got a solicitation from him to to subscribe to this service, and he, the guy did a trial subscription where the service is like email a question uh, or email a, a, a contract request or whatever, and we'll get back to you, you know, in 15 minutes, uh, shades of our uh, Joshua Browder conversation uh, not <laughs> long ago. Uh, only in that case, it took eight hours to get the answer back. Uh, but it was just so bizarre. And the, so the guy actually said he did actually get some answers back. Uh, I mean, one of them was, apparently way off and, and the other was just kind of a non-answer, but uh, it, he did actually get something back, I guess, from this guy. So I don't know what's going on there. So there, so there really is an invisible Harvey out there. <laughs> yeah, continuing on the Jimmy Stewart theme here, right? Yeah, I was just yeah. saying that, I was just writing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, well. Uh, Goodness. Sorry. <laughs> Anything else? So good at the we, order. We have to realize that have to realize that ninety percent of our audience probably has no clue what we're talking Stewart about. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. 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 Jimmy Stewart right. is, and, and what, why we're all laughing at the invisible. And, they can, and I, they can and I show Chat, the some of us are laughing. <laughs> ChatGPT may not even know who he is. Yeah. I don't know. If, yeah. Um, I, no, I know there was a, a wonderful life. They know who. Yeah. He is. Bob, there was there was a period right and i'm looking back it was around the, the middle of january where if you or i or anyone else posted about 
chat GPT or anything like that, we would get a message, kind of an, an a, uh, unsolicited message of, uh, you know, you can email your question to this. And we've, we've indexed all of the Supreme Court decisions. And yeah. that ran about a week and I'd never heard anything from them since. I think it was yeah. like stand.io, something right. like that. Yeah, I forgot about that. Well, yeah, this, this feels like the beginning of Twitter to me, because you remember all of the little, you know, the little companies that sprouted up about how you could leverage Twitter. Oh, and it was right like, too, yeah. you know, it was like, hey, just put your username and password into our site and we'll pull this information from Twitter for you. There and actually it, were some kind of cool tools around. Yeah, Twitter there was some cool stuff. So, but and now we're watching the, the demise of Twitter. Twitter is just so gone downhill. It's terrible. Are you, are you paying your uh, $8 a month to get your blue check, Bob? I'm not a blue check, no. I'm not a blue are you, check. Are you Greg? No. No, I'm not either. I swear, 20, my, one of my resolutions to 23 was to be better at using Twitter because LinkedIn's more my thing. And um, so I had a week of, and I was kind of counter trend as well, because obviously with everything going on at the time that I resolved to use it more, obviously people were leaving in their droves. Um, and I just have not. I don't know. I mean, it, you don't get the engagement on Twitter anymore that you used to get. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's rare. I mean, sometimes you'll see a good conversation pick up or something, but um, I, I just sometimes feel like I'm just throwing stuff out into the wind when I put stuff on. And, on and a lot of people that are using it are, are using the DMs of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm getting most of the DMs I'm getting are from people in uh, foreign countries who want to yeah. You're who special. Think I'm Bob. handsome. Who think I'm handsome? <laughs> um, and, so you you know they're scamming you. <laughs> um, I, I did have a great uh, conversation at Legal Week though with somebody who'd been dealing with Twitter and said that all of the all of the ED people had been fired and that the person that had taken over the role didn't know anything. Of, they, were, they were basically like, "So let, tell me more about what ED is." <laughs> Genuine conversation. <laughs> I was like, mm. They were like, "Can you help me?" All right, well, that's that's for next week. And then I see uh, uh, make the comment that the clubhouse is also not the same. I haven't even been on clubhouse in like six months or something. I don't even know what's happening. Yeah, that that was a good uh, six weeks run yeah, that they had. It was fun while it lasted. Yeah. Is that a all right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, clubhouse. Clubhouse is the audio oh. version. We were all oh, doing no. it in the pandemic or trying to, and everybody was like, oh yeah, you're a clubhouse. This is great. I, I missed that yeah. completely. Yeah, Facebook jumped on the bandwagon. I think Twitter did yeah. as well. There's still um, a bunch of people. It's like Nick Rishwain and uh, a few others who are like, every week they do a thing. There are like a bunch of legal tech people who get on and do a clubhouse thing where they talk about non-legal things. Yeah. <laughs> um, no. so. Well, in, you know, the one thing, and I mentioned it in the comments, but speaking of, of voice, is you know with the with the generative AI, once it kind of locks in on image and and voice as well. Yeah. My God, because I, I, I was just thinking, just the the amount of content that Bob is that's in your podcast that is yeah. basically on audio file. Imagine having that completely indexed and searchable and using that to answer questions. I mean, there's just tons of content out there that hasn't even been touched. Yeah, well, maybe I'll blog about this at some point, not the podcast, but my son, my other son, uh, uh, who's doing some programming stuff, um, took all of my columns for 20 years of my blog and put it in and, and uh, created a, a GPT interface into it so you could query it. Unfortunately, it doesn't work very well so far I, because it tends to be very, it has trouble sort of thinking across the columns. Like if you ask it, I don't know, who's the leading law practice management company or something, it's going to tend to like find some one column I wrote about a law practice management company and pick that one out or something. It's it, it, it's not doing a good job of, of pulling the stuff together, but he's working on it. So maybe I'll get that going. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, appreciate everybody. Greg, I appreciate you uh, joining us. Always great to have you and uh, everybody else. I uh, hope you have a good weekend and see you all next week. And I hope everybody is healthy and feeling well next week. See you then. Good to see you all. Have a great weekend. Have a great weekend. Uh -huh.